Good morning. I'd like to start by thanking the Small Business and Industry Assistance Group within CEDAR, FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, for convening the scientific workshop today, and the CDRH studios for producing it. I'm Dr. Judy Rakusen, Deputy Director for Safety in CEDAR's Division of Hepatology and Nutrition. The Division of Hepatology and Nutrition was created in March 2020 when the Division of Gastroenterology and Inborn Errors Products was broken down into smaller divisions. I want to welcome everyone today joining us online for this important workshop to discuss the role of phytosterols in parenteral nutrition-associated liver disease, or PNALD, also known as intestinal failure-associated liver disease, or IFALD. And a special thank you to our speakers and panelists for participating in today's workshop. Let's address the nomenclature issue at the outset. For more than a decade, there have been efforts to rename parenteral nutrition-associated liver disease, or PNALD, to intestinal failure-associated liver disease, or IFALD. And largely, you find IFALD in the current medical literature. However, approved FDA labeling for the intravenous lipid emulsions includes both terms. We're not going to solve this nomenclature issue today, and the two terms will be used interchangeably. This table summarizes the FDA-approved options for parenteral lipid treatment. The table is drawn from the Mizoff paper in Clinics and Perinatology, published in 2020, and it nicely summarizes the intravenous lipid emulsion products that are approved in the U.S., including their ingredients and components. I have added the years of the product approval in blue at the top of the columns. In the column with intralipid, I've also added neutralipid because it's another 100% soybean oil product that is improved in the U.S. Both products have been available since the 1970s. Next to that, you see Omegavin, approved in 2018, that is composed of 100% fish oil. It's different from the other intravenous lipid emulsions because its indication is limited to pediatric patients who have parenteral nutrition-associated cholestasis, or PNAC, a precursor to penald ifald In the next column is SMOF lipid. The SMOF is an acronym for each of the ingredients. It's 30% soybean oil, 30% medium-chain triglycerides, 25% olive oil, and 15% fish oil. I added the small a there that shows which of the products in the table are indicated in pediatric patients because it was just approved on March 22nd of this year for use in pediatric patients of all ages. In the next column is clinolipid, which contains 80% olive oil and 20% soybean oil. If you look further down in the table, you can see that the 100% soybean oil products have the highest level of phytosterols, and the omegavin has only a trace amount. Small lipid contains about half the amount of phytosterols as the 100% soybean oil products, and clinolipid is between the small lipid and the 100% soybean oil products. The alpha tocopherol content of omegavin and small lipid is similarly high and relatively lower in the 100% soybean oil products and clinolipid. The omega-6 fatty acids are highest in the 100% soybean oil products and lowest in omegavin and intermediate in the SMOF lipid and clinolipid products. The omega-3 fatty acids are the highest in omegavin, present at a modest level in the SMOF lipid product, and not present at all in the 100% soybean oil products or clinolipid. With regard to the color coding, the green indicates something that is relatively beneficial, and the red indicates something that is relatively detrimental. It's important to recognize that the health risks associated with intravenous lipid emulsions are not just due to the phytosterol content, but also with the balance of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. The unfavorable balance of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids in the 100% soybean oil products may have implications for the ability of hepatocytes to withstand oxidative stress and inflammation. As you can see in this figure from the Lee paper published in Hepatology International in 2020, penalt ifald has many risk factors. Some of them are non-modifiable and others are modifiable. Our focus today is on the parenteral nutrition component, highlighted with the blue arrow. I'm going to spend a few minutes reviewing the regulatory history of this phytosterol issue going back about a decade. 
In 2012, there was a GREAT workshop, standing for Gastroenterology Regulatory Endpoints and Advancements of Therapeutics, focused on PNALD. The goals of that workshop included defining PNALD and then designing suitable clinical trial designs. In particular, considering prevention versus treatment, focusing on patients with intestinal failure, and establishing an appropriate dose of intralipid. Subsequent to that workshop, issues regarding the hepatotoxicity with phytosterols came to the fore within the Division of Gastroenterology and Inborn Errors Products. At that time, a supplemental new drug application for clinolipid was under review and ultimately approved in 2013, and the division decided to issue post-market required studies, or PMRs, for the three intravenous lipid emulsions that were approved at the time. Intralipid, neutralipid, and clinolipid got a series of PMRs. Smoflipid got the same ones when it was approved three years later. It's important to note that the FDA Amendments Act of 2007 gave FDA the authority to require post-market safety studies when new safety information became available. In this case, the new safety information was published literature implicating phytosterols as a contributory factor in penal IFALD. This slide shows FDA's public-facing webpage that catalogs the post-market requirements and post-market commitments that FDA has issued since the authority was given to FDA in 2007. I'm including this slide to inform the attendees of today's workshop that the information on the post-market required studies can be obtained from this FDA webpage. The next two slides have the text of the PMRs that were required. The first PMR is to develop and validate an appropriate analytical method for determining the individual component phytosterol content in the product. The second PMR is to test the individual component phytosterol content in all batches of the product manufactured over a three-year period using the method developed under PMR number one. Based on these test results, manufacturers were to establish limits for each of the individual component phytosterols. PMR3 was to develop and validate an appropriate analytical method for measuring phytosterol levels in plasma. The fourth PMR required a randomized controlled trial in pediatric patients, including neonates, comparing the marketed product with a phytosterol depleted formulation of the marketed product to evaluate the incidence of liver injury, including penal IFAL. The aim of this scientific workshop is not to focus on the progress of the PMRs described in the last two slides. However, we'd like to highlight some related information that's been generated since those PMRs were issued. There's been one publication by Guthrie et al. earlier this year describing a non-clinical study of neonatal pigs treated with a phytosterol depleted or phytosterol enriched intravenous lipid emulsion that raised concerns. When Smoflipid was approved in 2016, the division concluded that the evidence base for the efficacy and safety in pediatric patients that had been submitted with the new drug application was inadequate to support approval in pediatric patients at that time, and the division required two PMRs under the authority of the Pediatric Research Equity Act, or PREA. To address the first PREA PMR, Fresenius Kabi conducted a comparison of SMOF lipid and a 100% soybean oil-based intravenous lipid emulsion in neonates to assess the occurrence of parenteral nutrition-associated cholestasis, or PNAC, a precursor to penald ifald In essence, this was a comparison of a lower phytosterol-containing intravenous lipid emulsion, SMOF lipid, to a higher phytosterol-containing intravenous lipid emulsion, the 100% soybean oil-based lipid emulsion, with the occurrence of PNAC as the safety endpoint. In March of this year, the Division of Hepatology and Nutrition approved a pediatric efficacy supplement for a SMOF lipid that included the data from four pediatric trials, including the PREA PMR trial described on the last slide, assessing PNAC in neonates. In the trial, PNAC was defined as a direct bilirubin greater than 2 mg per deciliter, with the second confirmed direct bilirubin elevation of greater than 2 mg per deciliter at least seven days later. p 
PNAC occurred in 2.4% of small lipid treated patients and 11.5% of 100% soybean oil lipid emulsion treated patients. Most of the cases of PNAC occurred in patients who were treated for longer than 28 days. This figure was included in SMOF lipid labeling with the recent pediatric approval in Section 6.1 Adverse Reactions Clinical Trials Experience and displays the time to event for the cases of PNAC in each of the treatment arms of study SMOF CP30018. You can see that there were two cases in the SMOF lipid arm that occurred early, between 14 and 28 days, and then there are nine cases that occurred in the 100% soybean oil comparison arm that predominantly occurred after 28 days. There is an increased risk for PNAC with longer duration of parenteral nutrition treatment, and this pattern of cases in the 100% soybean oil arm is consistent with accumulative hepatotoxicity with the product that has the higher phytosterol content and less favorable balance of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. The SMOF lipid labeling, finalized with the approval in the pediatric population, retains the warnings and precautions statement about penile IFAD in Section 5.1. Our morning session is going to lay out the scope of the PNOT IFAD problem for neonates, older pediatric patients, and adults. Our speakers are going to review the current utilization patterns of intravenous lipid emulsion treatments in the three populations, the changing incidence and epidemiology, natural history of PNOT IFAD over the past decade in the three populations, and we'll also hear about strategies to manage PNOT IFAD. Our morning panel discussion will focus on how big a problem PNAL IFAD is in 2022 and discuss whether there are specific populations that might be at higher or lower risk. In the afternoon, we'll focus on the role of phytosterols as a modifiable risk factor in the pathophysiology of PNAL IFAD and identify where we can intervene. We'll have talks on the metabolism of phytosterols, non-clinical evidence supporting the association between plant-based intravenous lipid emulsions and penalt IFAD, clinical evidence supporting the association between plant-based intravenous lipid emulsions and penalt IFAD, and hear about the scientific challenges to producing an intravenous lipid emulsion with reduced phytosterol content. We'll also get to hear industry perspectives from the three companies that are producing these intravenous lipid emulsion products. Fresenius Kabi, Baxter, and Bebron. We are thrilled to have speakers and panelists today who are deeply knowledgeable about this topic and who have devoted their careers to taking care of patients of all ages who require parenteral nutrition. We look forward to hearing the talks and panel discussions today, and we know that what we learn today will help us determine a path forward for how we can best care for patients in need of long-term parenteral nutrition to minimize the risk of penile IFAL. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Jerry Baer, and I'm a medical officer and team lead for neonatology and pharmacovigilance in the Office of Pediatric Therapeutics at FDA. I'll be moderating our first session today. Our first uh, group of speakers will walk us through the current state of understanding and clinical practice with parenteral nutrition and the role of phytosterols in, in penile IFAL, starting with the youngest patients and ending with the oldest. First up is Dr. Camelia Martin. Dr. Martin is a neonatologist who has just started a new position as Chief of the Division of Newborn Medicine at New York Presbyterian Cornell Medical Center in New York, after working for over 20 years at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School in Boston. Dr. Martin's research and expertise span the range from basic to translational to clinical research. So without further ado, let's hear from Dr. Martin. Hello, my name is Camelia Martin, and I'm an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Chief of the Division of Newborn Medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine, New York Presbyterian Hospital. I am a clinical translational physician scientist with a research focus in neonatal nutrition, lipid emulsions, and fatty acid biology. The following are my disclosures. So for objectives for this talk, 
I want to review the current utilization patterns of intravenous lipid emulsions and neonates. Then review the epidemiology of penold, including definitions, risks, and trends. And then discuss the medical strategies for the prevention of penold, as well as the management of penold. So let's begin with utilization patterns. On the left is a timeline where the safety and establishment of using intravenous solutions for glucose and amino acids, and then the first intralipid emulsion in 1961. There was FDA approval of intralipid in 1972, and this was also the first documented neonatal use of this lipid emulsion that was published in the literature. Intralipid remains the dominant maintenance routine lipid emulsion in the NICU. However, there is increasing use of fish oil containing lipid emulsions, again, for the routine maintenance and nutritional delivery of fats and energy, beginning about 2016 and 2018, concurrent with the literature of fish oil potentially being beneficial in the prevention and management of penold. To complete the timeline, small lipid was approved in 2016 for adults and then expanded that indication in 2022 to pediatrics, including neonates, and omegavin was approved in 2018 for the management of established penold. So when I discuss utilization patterns, you'll hear me talk about two terms. One is the maintenance and one is a therapeutic. Now these are my own terms, so some may disagree or, or some may want to suggest alternative terms, but this is how I think about it. Maintenance is the routine initiation of a lipid emulsion soon after birth to provide comprehensive macronutrient and energy delivery for nutritional care in neonates. Therapeutic is the initiation or a change in lipid emulsion delivery to manage established cholestasis or penold. And we'll discuss this further into the talk when we talk about preventative uh, and management options for penold. So the epidemiology of penold. In the literature, cholestasis has been defined as the conjugated bilirubin of greater than or equal to two mg per dl, but there's been multiple different definitions that sometimes makes it hard to summarize the literature. Other definitions have include greater than or equal to 1.5 mg per dl, or a conjugated bilirubin level that's greater than 20% of total bilirubin. It's also with these parameters and a prolonged duration of PN administration, usually greater than two weeks. There's also been a lot of interchangeable terms that makes it hard to synthesize the literature where penold has been a term, but as well as intestinal failure associated liver disease, TPN associated or induced cholestasis, and PN associated cholestasis or, or PNAC. And in fact, I think each of these conditions are a little different. And so sometimes we need to be careful about conflating the literature when discussing penold. The risk for penol can be medical or surgical. Medical um, etiologies include duration and prolonged PN, which you will hear me say a lot, and remains the, the most repeated and dominant risk for penol in neonates. The lack of ventral feeding, extremely low gestational age or low birth weight, intrauterine growth restriction, and severity of illness and concurrent morbidities such as sepsis and necrotizing enterocolitis. Surgical conditions include congenital anomalies such as atresias and abdominal wall defects, again necrotizing enterocolitis where surgical intervention was needed and sometimes leading on to the condition of short bowel syndrome. The authors of this study looked at the odds of developing penold based on some of the conditions mentioned in the previous slide. In the first four rows above the red line, you see the various birth weight categories. 
And you see that the lower the birth weight category, so less than 500 grams, has a substantially increased risk than babies that were in the heavier birth weight categories, but still an overall risk for babies less than 1,500 grams, approaching an odds of three. Below the red line are the various conditions that are also uh, put the infant at risk for developing penald, and those with some of the greatest odds or the highest odds are necrotizing enterocolitis requiring a surgical intervention, whether it be laparotomy or a placement of a Penrose drain, gastroschisis, and jejunal atresia. And the risks are really predictable because all of those things that we just mentioned are related to the need for that prolonged PN exposure. The more immature or the more devastating the gastrointestinal condition, the longer BFPN independence and um, dependence and the longer it takes to get to full enteral feedings. I think it's important to keep in mind that the toxicity of parental nutrition can come from a variety of factors that have been documented in the literature. Again, duration remains the strongest predictor but other implicated factors include cysteine and taurine deficiencies, aluminum and manganese toxicity, the oxidant balance as a result of being on PN. In addition, all macronutrients, all components measured as total exposure or dose over time have also been shown to be related to the risk of penald. Amino acids, carbohydrates, and lipids all being shown to be important risk factors. Now lipids have received the most attention and phytosterols have thought to be the offending agent and of course the subject of today's workshop. Later today, you're gonna to hear a discussion of phytosterol metabolism. So I just wanna highlight a few things here. So phytosterols are similar to structure to cholesterol and when orally ingested, remains largely unabsorbed in the gastrointestinal tract and can interfere with the absorption of cholesterol. And in fact, that mechanism is thought to be partly responsible for the health benefits seen in individuals who have a vegetable diet. However, when delivered intravenously, they can accumulate and when they accumulate systemically, they can impair bile acid synthesis, increase the phytosterol content in bile, and have an effect in cell membranes that can lead to cell lysis. This collectively can result in hepatocyte damage. Now there's other comorbidities that can interact with this pathway, augmenting the toxicity of phytosterols, such as sepsis, gut resection and immaturity, all risk factors that we see in critically ill newborns, especially preterm newborns in the neonatal intensive care unit. When thinking about trends of penald in the neonatal uh, population, it was actually difficult to pull together the data to see whether or not we've been holding steady, getting worse or improving in our, in our penald incidence. The incidents varied across many studies and obviously were dependent on the underlying studied population, whether term or preterm, or whether a high-risk population or all infants admitted to the NICU. In general, the incidence rates varied between 14 to 25% in the literature. But as an example of center to center variation, I remember a few years back, I was curious about this in our own institution and looked at, this is unpublished, but looked at our local data over 10 years and saw about a 6% incidence. So it can vary across centers. In thinking about potential arguments that maybe it's reducing over time, I think NICUs have gotten better at reducing the overall duration of PN exposure, feeding earlier and getting to feed sooner in preterm infants. And there's some small non-randomized data suggests that small flipid might be helpful in reducing the incidence in high-risk infants, even though we still need those large prospective randomized data to support this. 
arguments that maybe it's about the same and we're not improving it is that we don't have a lot of preventative strategies, which I will talk about later, and we continue to care for even more immature infants as young as 22 weeks gestation that may require a longer time of PN exposure. So for medical strategies in the prevention of PNALD, there's several things that we look to do. Again, initiate early enteral feedings if possible, getting to full enteral feedings faster, limiting any local intestinal and inflammatory effects from being NPO or nothing by mouth, and reducing that overall exposure rate. Studies have also shown that maybe protection from lights and oxidants, or even if avoiding potential toxins within the plastic bags, reducing comorbidities such as sepsis, and prophylactic ursodeoxycholic acid has been studied as a possible preventative measure, but it is not routinely used nor the standard of care. Most often it's been a lot of iterations of seeing how we can alter, uh, alter the way we administer PN by limiting the daily duration of PN, or PN cycling, lipid restriction, so taking a dose of three grams per kilo per day, which is pretty standard, down to one gram per kilo per day. And of course, now more recently, the potential use of these fish oil-based lipid emulsions. Now I'll concentrate the rest of our discussion on the lipid emulsions, again, since it's the focus of the workshop. So briefly, these are the three major lipids that we have potentially available to us in the use in the NICU. The first being intralipid, 20%, which is 100% soybean oil, and as a result has a high content of the N6 fatty acid linoleic acid, and again, because of a soybean source, high levels of phytosterols. On the complete opposite spectrum, all the way to the right, is omega ten percent which is 100% fish oil. As a result, has high levels of DHA and EPA. Now, omega is not approved for the prevention of penald or has been studied in that manner, so I will not speak about it further when discussing a, a prevent prevention strategies for penald. So in the middle is small lipid 20%, which is a multi-component lipid containing oil sources from soybean oil, MCTs, olive oil, and fish oil. As a result, has a lower level of linoleic acid, some representation of arachidonic acid, EPA, and DHA. Overall, a lower amount of phytosterols. Both fish oil containing lipid emulsions also have higher alpha tocopherol or vitamin E levels uh, for an antioxidant in the presence of these polyunsaturated fatty acids. So I wish I could present to you very strong favorable evidence of fish oil containing lipid emulsions being highly effective in the prevention of penald in the NICU or neonatal population. This is a meta-analysis from 2016 where they compared the various lipid emulsions compared to soybean oil in the prevention of penald. What I have boxed out in the second set of studies, boxed out in blue, are those studies that specifically looked at SMOF lipid versus the soybean oil lipid. And you can see that collectively across all the studies and then the summative measure, there was no reduction in penald. Now, what I find pretty interesting is that despite a sevenfold difference in phytosterol content between SMOF and the soybean oil, that we didn't see a strong effect in SMOF lipid in the prevention of penald. So other factors are definitely in play in this high-risk neonatal population. In fact, other meta-analyses have supported this, um, this one being from the Cochrane collaboration that did not find that any one particular lipid emulsion with or without fish oil compared to another was beneficial in the prevention of penald or cholestasis 
And unfortunately, that was true for other common neonatal morbidities that we see in the NICU. So when neonatologists admit a critically ill infant in the NICU, and many of them potentially at risk for penald, we have a decision to make. What lipid emulsion do we want to use, both considering for general nutritional management as well as prevention of penald? And right now it's down to sort of two choices, intralipid or small lipid. And the decision, I will argue, is not clear and is definitely controversial. So for intralipid, the positives are that we have a long history of use and over time have understood how to manage it, take care of lines, so that complications linked to lipid use, such as nosocomial sepsis, is fortunately very rare today. And it is well tolerated with short durations of use. Now, all preterm infants experience a biomagnification of fatty acids and the levels of DHA and ARA remain very important in development after birth. And so we must also consider this when we consider lipid emulsions. An intralipid, despite not having ARA, actually preserves a higher level of arachidonic acid compared to fish oil containing lipid emulsions. A negative is that it does have high phytosterol content and absolutely increases the risk for penald with longer durations beyond two weeks. SMOF levels have lower phytosterols and some evidence, albeit of low quality, for reduced penol. But phytosterols are still present and thus the risk of penol persists and there's that lack of high level evidence for the prevention of penald and as mentioned, curiously, even with the presence of arachidonic acid, levels are driven further into deficit when exposed to fish oil. So both choices come at a health risk outside of just penald. So I just wanna briefly review what I mean by these fatty acids, because I do think this is important to consider when we're talking about lipid emulsions and maybe what that next generation of lipid emulsion needs to look like. Here's a simple schematic showing the major polyunsaturated fatty acids. And when one compares a fish oil containing lipid emulsion to a control soybean oil, so the study here, group in blue is the fish oil containing emulsion, control soybean oil in yellow, you see that the DHA is increased. First, the deficit does not go away, but the overall levels of DHA are higher, but not much higher. Here, if you look at the axis, only about 0.4 mole percent. The EPA significantly rises almost by six-fold above what a neonate is usually used to seeing as EPA levels and the clinical consequence of that is unclear. But there's a lot of experts in fatty acid biology that have shown that EPA negatively regulates arachidonic acid. And so when looking at arachidonic acids in neonates, the study groups, again, despite having arachidonic acid, are lower than the infants who had received soybean oil. And the scales are different, but it's lower by over two mole percent. So this metabolic picture is unique to neonates who experience a profound biomagnification of both DHA and ARA in utero, and these fatty acids are required in the postnatal period for optimal development and is an important parallel consideration when we talk about lipid use in the NICU, both for nutrition and optimal metabolic management, as well as the risk for penal. For time's sake, I won't review this extensively, but here are references just demonstrating the essentiality of arachidonic acid in neonates. So for the last section regarding the management of penald, first, we shouldn't assume it's penald. We should always consider other possibilities. Ursodeoxycholic acid is often initiated and is switched to fat-soluble vitamins. But with the Obegevin approval, we now do have a lipid that's been approved and shown to be efficacious in the management of established penal. 
Here on the right is the insert for lipid for the omega event lipid, and I just want to highlight a few statements. Again, not indicated for the prevention of PNAC or PNALD. And begin as soon as conjugated bilirubin levels are 2 mg per dl or greater. And the dose is at 1 gram per kilo per day. So what about SMOF lipid in the management of PNALD? Again, small cohort historical control studies have shown that it may be more effective than intralipid in improving PNALD and liver injury measures. There's been no head-to-head -head studies with omegavin, and some have chosen, some NICUs have chosen SMOF lipid to deliver more fats to a growing premature infant but they risk failure and a delay in omegavin treatment, which may reduce responsiveness to omegavin. So if such a strategy is, in take, is taken, this risk needs to be mitigated with clearly crafted protocols and guidance. So in summary, the risk of penald in newborns is limited to select factors, including extremely low gestational age, infants, gastrointestinal surgical diagnoses, and prolonged duration of PN. Initiation of feeding and feeding advancement is the best preventative strategy for PNALD. And neither available lipid emulsion meets the unique needs of preterm infants or have been shown to be highly efficacious in reducing PNALD as a preventative measure in high-risk infants. And the conclusive role thus for SMOF Lipid is pending for prevention and management. And there is a clinically proven FDA-approved lipid in omegavin for the management of established PNALD. So if there's a call to action, what would I think much of us want to see for a premature, uh, for a lipid emulsion specific to the premature infant? It needs to support overall fat and energy requirements as part of our general nutritional strategies specifically enriched for DHA and ARA at levels that meet the needs of the preterm infant, be EPA poor, vital sterol poor, but vital sterols in this population may only be part of the story and other factors are definitely in play. Thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion period. Thank you, Dr. Martin. I. I... As a neonatologist, I frankly love the idea of a specific designer lipid just for preemies. Um, next up, we have Dr. Samuel Kokosius. He is a pediatric gastroenterologist and hepatologist who directs the Intestinal Care Center and the Small Bowel Transplantation Center at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. His current research focuses on identifying biomarkers for intestinal adaptation after small bowel resection as well as biomarkers for rejection of intestinal transplantation. So now we will hear from Dr. Kokosius on pediatric penal IFAL. Good morning. I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for asking me to speak about phytosteroids and intestinal failure associated liver disease in older children. Um, however, I must admit that it's been a somewhat daunting task to find meaningful literature regarding these older children. Infantile parenteral nutrition associated cholestasis is well described in the literature, as is intestinal failure associated liver disease among adults. But the older child is a poor orphan with only a handful of papers describing his or her condition. Despite this impediment, I'll do my best to describe what I see in the older child with intestinal failure and liver disease who's on parenteral nutrition. The following are my disclosures I've received both research funding and been a consultant for various pharmaceutical firms. First, let's define our topic. Koloff and Sokol defined intestinal failure associated liver disease as a spectrum of liver disease, including cholestasis, progressing to cirrhosis, steatohepatitis, or gallbladder disease in patients with intestinal failure who've been on parenteral nutrition for long periods of time and for whom uh, other causes of liver injury have been excluded. PNAC, or parenteral nutrition-associated cholestasis, is the cholestasis that infants develop with an elevated conjugated serum bilirubin, customarily greater than one or two milligrams per DL, or greater than 20% of total bilirubin. Uh, these patients will have gotten parenteral nutrition for more than two weeks. 
Parenteral nutrition associated liver disease is the outdated term for IFALD. IFALD is the preferred term at present because occasional children with intestinal failure have liver disease totally unrelated to parenteral nutrition administration and other factors are involved in this. There are significant impediments to determining the prevalence of IFALD in older children. First, how do we define older children? Some would have you consider older children greater than 12 months of age or up to 18 years of age. Others stratify children according to whether they're prepubescent or postpubescent. Still others have stratified children by five-year intervals. Colliff and Sokol's definitions notwithstanding, the definition of intestinal failure associated liver disease has remained nebulous in the literature. Some, such as Abi Nader and Pickler, have accepted a definition of abnormal liver enzymes as low as one and a half times normal. In fact, there's been no consensus of what constitutes cholestasis. Some investigators insisting that a total bilirubin of three milligrams per dl is significant, others a bilirubin of two milligrams per dl, and yet others accepting one milligram per dl as cholestasis. Studies including histologic assessment are relatively infrequent. Exclusion of other etiologies for liver disease are often not stipulated and not established. And additionally, the constituents of PN have uh, changed over the years. A series of patients that uh, have studied patients for more than 10 years were show that patients were treated differently at the beginning of the decade than they are now. For example, today, hardly anyone gets more than a gram or two of fat per kilo per day, and SMOF lipid has become the starting lipid of choice within many institutions. Furthermore, the default therapy for some clinicians is to lower the dose or stop lipid completely following minimal enzyme elevation. First, let's turn to infantile IFALD, or more precisely, intestinal failure-associated cholestasis, whose etiology is relatively well described. Prematures are physiologically cholestatic because they have immature bile acid uptake in the ileum, and also immature hepatic bile acid uptake. Thereby, they reduce their bile acid pool, and furthermore, they maintain a large percentage of their bile acid pool in the serum compartment. Hence, they're very vulnerable to liver injury when the liver is exposed to noxious substances. About 15 years ago, the prevalence of, of infantile cholestasis in infants on TPN had been about 20 to 50 percent. Certain variables have been correlated with cholestasis recurrent bloodstream infections, according to the classic paper by Judy Sondheimer, and high-dose parenteral lipids, such as described by Petraea Kober and earlier by uh, Kishore Iyer, have been associated with cholestasis. Fortunately, the prevalence uh, of cholestasis seems to be declining. Our own data confirm this observation. At least 75% of infantile mortality among children on PN is attributable to liver failure. Our survival data reveal that we've gone from 2.1 deaths per 100 patient years down to 0.18 deaths per 100 patient years between um, 2013 and 2018. This is a full order of magnitude decline. We've also observed that from having listed 19 of our patients for bowel and liver, and liver transplant in the early part of the millennium, we've only listed one of our patients recently our other transplant recipients have come from outside our hospital. In addition, between 2006 and 2021, our prevalence of prolonged cholestasis among the intestinal rehab population has declined from 25% to 4%. I'm going to show a slide about IFALD in adults. A cross-sectional study from the Cleveland Clinic investigated 208 patients of whom 162 could be analyzed. All of them had been on TPN for greater than six months. The authors defined mild enzyme elevation as twice normal, moderate as two to five times normal, and severe as five times more normal or more. Severe liver disease was a bilirubin of greater than three milligrams per dl, elevated prothrombin time, elevated to greater than three seconds of prolongation, and uh, an albumin of less than three and a half grams per dl. The duration of parenteral nutrition was about two years, and these patients received relatively high protein but low fat solutions. While 154 of the 162 had abnormal liver enzymes, only seven had severe liver disease. 
these patients are phenotypically much more like older children than our infants on TPM. So let's move to the subject of our talk today. Uh, unfortunately, the data on older children are far from clean. Most studies don't stratify as to whether PN was initiated during infancy or later the, in, on in life, nor do they have histologic information on patients. Furthermore, most studies don't stipulate just how much fat, protein, and carbohydrate these patients received. There are several case series that do include histologic findings. The three by Soden, Mercer, and Matsumoto all suggest that patients with bilirubin normalized following a course of fish oil-based lipid emulsion continue to display ongoing or worsening hepatic fibrosis over time. What's unique about the Matsumoto study was that the histology was obtained from hepatic explants following combined liver bowel transplant in patients who had signs of non-cholestatic liver disease and irreversible intestinal failure. Now, in contrast to those three studies, the group from Boston Children's suggested that early fibrosis is of no clinical significance and may disappear later on in life if cholestasis resolves. They reviewed the course of 51 children who had cholestasis and either severe fibrosis or, or cirrhosis and had been placed on omegamin. The cholestasis had resolved in two-thirds, and two-thirds had been on full enteral nutrition. Over 12 months following the omegamin use, bilirubin remained normal, AST and ALT remained normal, synthetic function remained normal, and the AST to platelet ratio, a surrogate marker of fibrosis, declined and remained normal. It's notable that I've followed about 1,500 patients with intestinal failure associated liver disease over my career and have seen only two whose cholestasis had resolved but whose fibrosis was severe enough to produce variceal bleeding. While there's some conflicting data regarding the consequences of ongoing fibrosis, further insights come from the Great Ormond Street Hospital in a paper written by Pickler and colleagues and from the Helsinki Children's Hospital in a series of papers written by Mutnan and colleagues. First, let's turn to the Pickler study. IFALD was defined as one of three types. If liver enzymes were 1.5 times normal, this would be type 1. Type 2 would be the equivalent of type 1 plus a bilirubin of greater than 3 milligrams per dl, and type 3 included a bilirubin of greater than 6 milligrams per dl. The specific PN recipe was not stated other than to stipulate that everyone had been started on intralipid and transitioned to lipofundin or SMOF lipid if either enzymes or bilirubin had risen. The table comparing characteristics of children without IF ALD with uh, those children who had uh, IFALD is a rather busy table, but I think two important points should be addressed. These are that patients who had no IFALD were those who had started their parental nutrition at older than 1.5 years or greater. Second, the average ages of those with no IFALD were much older that is 18 months at the start of their PN, than were those with IFALD, who were six months or so on average. Third, only 17% of patients beginning PN after their first birthday developed liver disease, while 24 to 39% of those beginning PN earlier developed liver disease. Along the same lines, Mutnin studied 38 pediatric patients. 16 had been receiving PN for 74 months on average, whereas 22 had been off PN for an average of almost three years. Of those off PN, none were cholestatic, 9% had inflammation, 64% had fibrosis, and 45% steatosis. So fibrosis and steatosis predominate, much like adult liver disease. Notably, in Finland, the amount of parenteral lipid provided was lower than we customarily use in the U.S. Fat calories only comprised 0 to 33 percent of calories. Only four patients received fish oil. Here we see bar graphs showing that liver histology is abnormal in both patients with cholestasis on PN or without cholestasis on PN and patients who are completely off PN. There was a somewhat higher percentage of patients 
who had fibrosis if they were still on PM, but stage two fibrosis was almost equally prevalent whether or not the patients were on or off PM. Steatosis was just as common in those off PM, and the degree of steatosis was just as severe in that group as in the group still on PM. In contrast, very few patients off PM had persistent portal inflammation in the bottom left. And furthermore, none of the patients had cholestasis if they were off PN, whereas almost 40% who were on PN were cholestatic. A second movement series looked at seven patients who received PN for 53 months. Again, their fat intake was only an average of 0.3 grams per kilo per day, much lower than we use in the U.S. They were compared to 18 patients off TPN for nearly six years. Of the entire population, 17 had fibrosis and 13 steatosis. Transcriptional analysis and immunohistochemistry were used to quantitate profibrotic proteins and to determine the gene expression of precursor genes for profibrotic proteins and for inflammatory cytokines. The main observation was a TGF beta, smooth muscle actin, IL-1 and 2, EGF, and matrix metalloproteinase 9 were all elevated in both the PN group and in the group who had graduated off PN. In addition, the inhibitor of melanoproteinases, which is upregulated in response to fibrosis, was elevated in both groups. MMP7, uh, which is the metalloproteinase upregulated in biliary atresia, was identical and relatively low in both groups. Thus, patients off TPN for years seem to have persistent upregulation of the genes that control fibrogenesis and steatosis. Another important observation by the group in Helsinki was that fibroblast growth factor 19 seems to be deficient in a substantial number of patients on TPN following ileal resection or those who have dysfunctional ileum. This observation is important because this growth factor binds with fibroblast growth factor 4 in the liver and then down-regulates bile acid synthesis from cholesterol in response to either biliary obstruction or bile acid transporter dysfunction. In children with depleted FGF19, the hepatocyte will be subjected to bile acid overload and then subsequent damage. In addition, FGF19 down-regulates fibrogenesis and steatosis via the clotho co-receptor. This slide shows on the left graph that patients with an autonilium have the lowest levels of FGF19 and those with dysfunction intermediate levels as compared to controls. The middle graph shows that, the, uh, that there's an inverse relationship between the stage of hepatic fibrosis and the FGF19 level. Those with the lowest levels have the most fibrosis. On the right, we see that patients with portal inf inflammation also seem to have the lowest levels of, of FGF19, and those without inflammation have intermediate levels, but healthy controls have the highest levels. Now, this slide shows how liver disease can progress from infants, from the findings in infants to those in older children. Uh, on the upper left, we see a liver with giant cells, some inflammation, and cholestasis, but no fibrosis while on TPN. On the upper right, there's further progression of the inflammatory process. And then in the lower left, we see bridging fibrosis. And on the lower right, we see quite profound micro and macro vesicular steatosis. This progression is what Mutinen and colleagues have proposed to be the sequence of events that occurs from infancy to childhood. Mutinen and, and her colleagues uh, also looked further into the predictors of progression. They studied 77 children who were biopsied at a mean age of 1.7, then rebiopsied nearly three years later. Of this group, liver enzymes and bilirubin had normalized in about half, remained mildly elevated in about a quarter, persisted but didn't worsen in a fifth, and then progressed to liver failure in about 5%. The three factors predictive of progression were liver stiffness by elastography, 
persistently depressed serum citrulline, and a rising GGT. All three are highly predictive. Now you see the receiver operating curves of these three predictors. The areas under the curve of all three were at 0.83 or greater, meaning that they were all highly predictive of progression. Now let's turn to steatosis. Uh, could it be due to high hyperinsulinism? We do know that hyperinsulinism from a, an excessive glucose load can induce hepatic lipogenesis. It releases free fatty acids into the serum. And as well, there are, is a release of adipokines from adipose tissue. All of these predispose to steatosis of the liver. Yet another factor that may be responsible is choline deficiency. Alan Buckman, who is giving the next talk, described free choline deficiency in a population of adults with steatosis on PN. He discovered that the administration of PN, uh, of parenteral choline, seemed to reverse their cholestasis. Tim Santango, collaborating with Alan and with Kishar Iyer, studied the choline status of infants on TPN. Tim studied 14 patients and 14 controls. The presence or absence of liver disease was not mentioned, but patients had been on PN for 44 weeks, and they were all infants of 6 to 18 weeks of age. About half of them were premature. What Tim found was that phosphatidylcholine, glycerophosphocholine, and free choline were no different from control values. However, among those patients who were receiving greater than 90% of their calories parenterally, phosphocholine, which is the direct precursor of free choline, was depressed. Here you see a bar graph demonstrating that phenomenon. You can see that the patients on greater than 90% PN had the lowest phosphocholine levels. Now, here, Kalaf and Sokol have shown us a model of what might be going on in patients with uh, intestinal failure-associated liver disease. Young infants on PN are predominantly cholestatic and they have inflamed livers. The older child is likely to have steatosis and fibrosis, phenotypically very much like adult liver disease. Now, what are the opposing factors that produce liver disease or protect against liver disease on children on PN? The forces predisposing to liver disease include multiple central line infections, as we heard um, from um, Judy Sonheimer, the endotoxemia, which we showed in 2011, is associated with a worsening liver pattern in um, patients on PN. A possible genetic predisposition may be related. Uh, an MDR3 mutation has been described in both China and in Holland. Prematurity itself, because of immature uh, uptake and transport of bile acids, and parenteral solutions that have excessive protein, sugar, or fat, specifically phytosterols, or a paucity of antioxidants, or creation of jejunostomies, which interrupt the enterohepatic circulation of bile acids. Protective factors include provision of balanced fatty acids, provision of antioxidants, such as vitamin E, early feeding, possibly provision of GLP-2, which we know uh, upregulates fibroblast growth factor four, or early stomach closure to restore enterobatic circulation. I would just like to speculate regarding potential therapies that could be studied in greater detail. First, the choline status of children in, on PN should be investigated, and the administration of parenteral choline considered. Second, for those who have elevated acute phase reactants and signs of hepatic inflammation, a trial of anakinra, an IL-1 receptor inhibitor, might be beneficial. So in summary, while phytosterols undoubtedly can be deleterious to the liver in both infants and older children, older children appear to display a different phenotype, much more like that of adults with IFALD. The presence of IFALD in patients on minimal or no parenteral lipid suggests that factors other than phytosterol excess can produce liver dysfunction 
among this population. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kokoshis, for highlighting the differences between penile IFAL beginning in the neonatal and early infant period compared to PN exposure um, and its effects beginning later in childhood. Um, our final speaker, Dr. Alan Bookman, is the medical director of the Intestinal Rehabilitation and Transplant Center at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His broad expertise <clears throat> excuse me, includes inflammatory bowel diseases, short bowel syndrome and intestinal failure, and nutritional support for bowel disorders. Dr. Bookman will now provide perspectives on adult penile eye valve. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Alan Bookman, professor of clinical surgery, a gastroenterologist, and the medical director of the Intestinal Rehabilitation and Transplant Center at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I also serve as the medical director for gastroenterology for Anthem Health. Today, I've been charged with discussing intestinal failure associated liver disease, or IFELD, in adults. One minor disclosure, I'm a minor shareholder in Proterra Therapeutics. Liver test abnormalities during a parental nutrition were identified within just a couple of years after the start of parental nutrition, identified first in children and later in adults. We know that some liver test abnormalities in the AST and ALT may occur in upwards of two thirds of older children and adults that are fed parenterally for at least two weeks. The prevalence is even higher in neonates, specifically preterm neonates. Typically, however, this increase in the hepatic aminotransferases is transient, peaking at about three to five weeks, except for the alkaline phosphatase, which may continue uh, to rise. They typically become normal within one to four weeks after parental nutrition can be stopped because absorption has improved. The bilirubin, though, is generally not elevated until end-stage liver disease has developed, with the exception of neonates. However, the AST and ALT are insensitive and nonspecific indicators of hepatic pathology, especially in regard to IFELD. Now, as I mentioned, the alkaline phosphatase starts to increase generally around six weeks. In this study uh, from Clark et al., uh, one can see that the AST and the ALT uh, re remain um, uh, somewhat uh, mildly elevated, but the alkaline phosphatase starts to increase uh, at about week uh, six. How do we define IFELD? Well, for one, a patient has to have intestinal failure and require long-term parental nutrition. We define it as liver disease resulting from intestinal malabsorption and or components of the parental nutrition solutions in the absence of other etiologies, including viral and autoimmune hepatitis, uh, alcohol, drugs, uh, and biliary obstruction. And in fact, actually, it has been defined more specifically uh, by the Intestinal Rehabilitation and Transplant Association as a persistent elevation of liver enzymes, alkaline phosphatase, and gamma glutamyl transferase to a level of one and a half times the upper limit of normal for at least six months in adults or at least six weeks in children. It requires both cholestasis, which would be indicated in the laboratory by an increase in the serum bilirubin uh, or alkaline phosphatase or in a biopsy, as well as steatosis, which would be present on either imaging, uh, such as a CT or MR or bi uh, biopsy. One of these may be uh, predominant, which I'll discuss. There also may be other signs of liver disease, including fibrosis and cirrhosis. It's notable, though, that end-stage liver disease may occur in the absence of significant fibrosis uh, or cirrhosis. The typical pathologies that we see are what I call steatocholestasis. There's always steatosis and there's always cholestasis, which is one of the pathognomonic differentiations from NASH uh, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In neonates, cholestasis is generally predominant with some steatosis. In older children and adults, it's generally steatosis that is predominant with some cholestasis, although cholestasis may predominate in some individuals. The pattern of steatosis is also uh, unique uh, in that um, there is often micro and macro vesicular steatosis, 
microvesicular steatosis being very rare in NASH. Uh, cirrhosis, uh, typically when it does occur, uh, the fibrosis begins with portal expansion uh, and progresses in a characteristic uh, jigsaw type uh, pattern. You can see the hepatocytes in red on the slide in the upper right uh, with the uh, collagen uh, fibrosis uh, in blue. What's the incidence of liver disease? Well, we don't really know, and there are ongoing studies to determine this. Uh, back approximately 20 years ago, uh, Cavici uh, in Bernard Messing's group from Paris surveyed their patients and found that after being on parental nutrition for at least six years, uh, upwards of 70% of their patients had developed eye felt. And they had defined this uh, similarly to the definition that I have presented with uh, ALT, AST, and alkaline phosphatase, at least two of these being elevated to at least one and a half times the upper limit of normal for more than six months. Since this time, however, most programs are seeing a much lower uh, incidence, uh, estimated to be around 25 or 30 percent of patients. Uh, but again, studies are ongoing to determine that prevalence. In one of the more uh, recent studies that was done that was presented at the American Society for Parental and Natural Nutrition meeting last month. In a study of 464 long-term home parental nutrition patients, it was found that approximately 30% of these patients uh, developed increased alkaline phosphatase uh, to approach and exceed one and a half times the upper limit of, of normal uh, while they were on parental nutrition. And in fact, actually as many as uh, at some point during the 36 months that these patients were examined, as many as 76% had an uh, elevation of alkaline phosphatase that exceeded one and a half times the upper limit of normal at, at some point. The thing that we're most concerned about, however, are those patients that develop complicated liver disease because these are the patients who die or end up needing a transplant. In the Cavici study, after eight years of being on home parental nutrition, they found that over half of their patients had what they called a complicated liver disease, which were manifestations of end-stage liver disease or cirrhosis with an elevated bilirubin of at least three and a half for over a month, ascites, signs of portal hypertension, hepatic encephalopathy, or a factor five level of less than 50%. And again, this incidence is likely less than that uh, these days just because of better overall care of the patients and also for reasons that we don't completely understand. In this uh, study from Cavici, uh, even after uh, eight years of parental nutrition, one can see the progressive decline in the likelihood of being free of liver disease. And in fact, uh, only 5% of their patients after eight years uh, had no evidence of histologic liver disease uh, and 7% had no evidence of uh, either clinical manifestations or uh, abnormal uh, uh, liver tests. This is notable that the biopsies can be abnormal despite uh, normal uh, liver tests. In the Brigham Hospital experience uh, of uh, some 42 uh, patients, and this data again is from a number of years ago, but approximately 15% of their patients developed end-stage liver disease. In this uh, Kaplan-Meier death plot, uh, one can see that approximately 13% of their patients uh, died from end-stage liver disease after 10 years, and 50% or one out of the two patients that had lived to 20, 20 years uh, also died from end-stage liver disease. So it clearly is an issue uh, in, a, in adults um, uh, just as it is in uh, children and, and neonates. What are the risk factors for iPhone? Well, we know that the less bowel there is, the more severe the malabsorption. In an interesting study from Colfat and her colleagues uh, in the Netherlands, they found that uh, a citrulline concentration, which is a surrogate marker of intestinal mass of less than 30 micromoles per mil, and a fibroblast growth factor 19 of less than 107 picograms per mil, were indicators uh, of the development of IFEL. The FGF19, of course, has a role in terms of bile secretion. What is interesting, however, is that uh, the serum C4 and total bile salt ratio did not, uh, was not associated with 
the, the development of Eifeld. Uh, and so this would suggest that there is no hepatotoxic accumulation of bile salts such as lithocholic acid or an increased synthesis in uh, the bile acids. In addition, uh, the colon did not play a, a role. Uh, in a study by uh, Cambrier, from, uh, also in the Paris group, uh, a number of uh, years ago, there was a suggestion that uh, the less colon in continuity with small bowel, the greater the likelihood of developing liver disease. That was not the case in this study. And most interesting, and part of our discussion today, is that uh, the amount of daily lipid had no role uh, in terms of being a risk factor for the development of Eifeld, nor uh, the percentage of energy requirements that were supplied by uh, parental nutrition. There are a number of factors that we heard early uh, this morning that may, be, uh, may predispose patients to develop liver disease. Uh, I will caution that the vast majority of those are completely hypothetical, uh, and not only is there limited uh, animal data, but no human data. So I will discuss a few uh, issues uh, that are of concern in, in the adult uh, patient for which there is human uh, data, and that includes uh, excessive uh, dextrose. Um, in rat models, as well as in human models, uh, excess dextrose, um, where the maximum glucose oxidation rate of five milligrams per kilogram per minute is exceeded, has certainly been associated with the development of steatosis, and actually the replacement of the carbohydrate energy source with a lipid has resulted in a decrease in uh, the steatosis uh, and eye filled. Uh, what's interesting here also is that the addition of insulin uh, had uh, no additional uh, benefit despite the hyperglycemia that these uh, patients had. In terms of lipids, we know that not enough lipids are a problem and too much lipid is a problem at least two to 4% of total calories need to be provided as linoleic fatty acid, uh, which, and given the fact that um, intralipid, for example, is approximately 50% uh, 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 linoleic fatty acid, so the total calories uh, that would need to be uh, from intralipid uh, would, would be on the range of four to 8%. On the other hand, lipid overload certainly can cause Eifeld. Uh, greater than three grams per kilogram per day uh, of uh, intralipid in numerous studies has been associated with an increased alkaline phosphatase and increased bilirubin. And this is of note because in the OmegaVin studies that have been done from Boston, these studies represented really a comparison to historic controls where uh, many of the uh, infants received three to four grams per kilogram per day. Uh, and uh, OmegaVin represented really a lipid reduction a strategy in addition to uh, providing a different fatty acid source. We know that uh, the, the liver itself is, is actually abnormal uh, with um, an inflammatory infiltrate in the uh, portal areas. There's also bile duct uh, uh, proliferation and bile duct plugs uh, that are associated with uh, lipid overload. And this has occurred uh, in adults uh, that uh, by uh, accident were given excess lipid emulsions in what's called lipid overload syndrome. Carnitine deficiency, interestingly, is still proposed as a cause for uh, parental nutrition associated liver disease or intestinal failure associated liver disease, despite being one of the only nutrients that's been studied uh, in a controlled fashion. And Bauer from the Mayo Clinic showed that there is no improvement in liver tests or even hepatic uh, fatty acid uh, oxidation, which is what uh, carnitine is, is useful, uh, and no improvement in steatosis uh, despite increasing the carnitine concentrations in the blood with carnitine supplementation. Uh, and it, it's also been shown in other studies to have no effect on uh, fatty acid oxidation. So carnitine supplementation really has no role in these patients that's, despite its use today. I mentioned earlier on about lipid restriction. Well, in the Cavici study, they sort of randomly divided their patients into those that received more than a gram per kilogram per day and those that received less than a gram per kilogram per day. And clearly, as you can see in this plot, that the likelihood of being free of liver complications 
was sub substantially greater in those patients that received less lipid emulsion. But these are also patients that had greater absorption and required less energy from parental nutrition. So the, in this historic controlled study, it's really hard to know whether uh, preemptively providing less lipid or more lipid makes a difference. And in fact, to date, there has not been a randomized study of uh, where the provision of greater or less than one gram per kilogram per day of long chain fatty acid emulsions has, has, has been studied. How do we predict the development of IFELD? Well, again, the coal fat group from uh, the Netherlands has developed an interesting model for end-stage intestinal failure, somewhat along the lines of the model for end-stage liver disease. And, and with a somewhat complicated formula, uh, they were able to use, again, the citrulline uh, as well as the FGF-19. And in addition, uh, the number in, of infusions of parental nutrition per week, not the total volume. And they were able to predict five-year survival if there's the score uh, varied between 3 and 20 of about 80 percent uh, and a score in which the FGF uh, 19 was uh, less than 107 or the citrulline was greater than 20 those that had a score of ranging from 20 to 40 had a 58 percent five-year survival and those obviously that had the least bowel uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the the most fibroblast growth factor 19 uh, had a only a 14 percent uh, survival. These were all adult patients. How do we prevent IFIL? Well, we want to prevent or avoid overfeeding, especially with dextrose, but also uh, with lipid based on the retrospective data that we have. Absorption is obviously an issue. We want to preserve intestinal length and use the colon as much as possible based on the uh, Chambrier uh, study showing that the more colon and, and more absorption, uh, the lower the likelihood of Eifeld, even though the Colfat study showed no relationship with colon. We want to maintain oral intake that stimulates gallbladder contraction for those that have their gallbladder remaining in situ. There's some data that would suggest that cycling the parental nutrition to overnight use versus a continuous 24-hour infusion may also result in fewer lipid abnormality or liver abnormalities. And despite the fact that, as I mentioned, there's no prospective study, standard practice is to limit uh, lipids to less than one gram per kilogram per day. We also want to try to avoid sepsis, although quite frankly, there is no long-term data that would suggest that sepsis has any role to play uh, in those patients that develop Eifeld uh, after uh, six weeks of, uh, of uh, parental nutrition in children or six months in adults. But it's obviously always a good idea to avoid sepsis because of its own independent uh, morbidity and mortality. Let me talk a little bit about the fish oil-based emulsions in adults. Uh, a megavin, of course, is not approved for use in adults at this point, but it's important to note that it's not a complete lipid emulsion. It has no essential fatty acids, and patients can potentially develop fatty acid deficiency with it. Um, the small lipid, though, does have fish oils and does have essential uh, fatty acids, but there is no data that, that would suggest that the incidence of Eifeld is any less uh, with the new lipid emulsion. And therefore, uh, the FDA has approved these, um, these lipid emulsions as energy sources or lipid sources, but not actually to treat uh, IFELD. It's notable that in many of the case series, uh, uncontrolled data uh, with uh, omegavin, the, the total serum bilirubin has decreased. Uh, and when compared to those that received uh, intralipid, it's decreased faster. But I'll ask you, does size or quickness really matter? There's a decrease in cholestasis, but in those patients with cirrhosis, the cirrhosis remains. Uh, and in fact, David Mercer, who is speaking today, published a study where a number of their patients had improvements in their serum numbers, but the fibrosis and uh, Eifeld continued to progress. And in Dr. Burns, a uh, more recent study published uh, this year in JPEN uh, in pigs uh, showed that uh, despite a, a phytosterol um, reduced emulsion, 
the, the, the all of the animals still developed eye felt on biopsies despite their serum numbers uh, being uh, improved. The big question is whether does fish oil actually have any role? There are studies certainly in inflammatory bowel disease that would suggest that the fish oils can can stimulate inflammation and at the same time they can decrease inflammation. And does that have any role in eye felt? Or is the value of fish oil really confused because it's been studied really only versus a lipid reduction strategy? There have been no placebo controlled trials. The important thing to note is that fibrosis persists despite the use of fish oils and reduction in phytosterols. And so one of the questions, of course, is whether the increase in phytosterols results because of liver disease or whether it causes liver disease. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Mercer has pointed out in his case series, there is a decrease in cholestasis and the bilirubin, uh, inflammation and biopsies decreased, but fibrosis continued um, unchanged or increased, and the same with uh, ductal proliferation, and the fish oil seemed to have no effect on steatosis, which again is the predominant form of eye felt in most adults. What are the risk factors for development of fibrosis? Well, certainly in ultra short bowel, a number of studies have, have shown uh, that. Uh, concomitant ethanol use, obviously, uh, it, just like if somebody has hepatitis C, we would recommend that they cease drinking because they've already got one insult to the liver, why give them another? But what, what was interesting uh, in uh, the uh, Cazell Zahayton study was that the parental nutrition uh, composition was a non-factor in the development of consistent with the other reports from Mercer and others. And, and similarly, sepsis really had no uh, role as well in the development of, uh, of fibrosis. Well, what about choline deficiency? Well, it's interesting that that choline deficiency in 15 or so animal species drives hepatocellular uh, injury. Uh, and in fact, in uh, humans, it's been shown to uh, result uh, in the development of steatosis. And there's also a decrease in bioflow. Choline is uh, not generally thought to be a required nutrient because it can be synthesized by methionine in the diet. But nutrients that are infused parenterally don't undergo first pass metabolism in the liver like nutrients, the same nutrients even, that are absorbed directly uh, from the enteral route through the portal uh, circulation. With choline deficiency, there's a decrease in VLDL production, which of course then uh, limits the transport of uh, fat uh, from the liver. In perhaps the only placebo-controlled trial of, uh, of nutrients or medications uh, to treat uh, Eifeld, in this uh, small pilot study uh, that uh, was based on data from a study that I did a number of years ago, this was uh, presented at uh, the Aspen meeting uh, two years ago, uh, that with choline infusion versus placebo, there's a, a significant decrease in the steatosis when the CT scores were, were converted to a more contemporary MRI PDFF. And you can see on the right, uh, a, a patient that has um, a very fatty liver, the liver being uh, on the left of the screen, uh, and after uh, choline uh, infusion, uh, you can see near complete resolution uh, and increased density of the liver on the left, and now very similar to the spleen, which is on the, the lower right of the CT image. And indeed, cholestasis improved as well uh, when the alkaline phosphatase uh, was used as a marker of cholestasis. And again, choline has a role in uh, bile flow uh, as well as uh, the export of uh, triglyceride and fat uh, from the liver. Why would choline deficiency occur? Well, in this interesting study from Stegnick and, and Beston uh, from the University of Iowa many years ago, they looked at the transsulfuration pathway of the liver and they measured plasma cysteine. They didn't measure choline, but cysteine is produced in the same pathway. And when these normal medical students, uh, perhaps they, they weren't, well, perhaps they were normal actually, just looking for a good fellowship that they volunteered for this to have uh, nasogastric tubes uh, placed and IVs placed. And they had methionine infused nasogastrically and intravenously in a crossover study. 
the cysteine concentrations actually decreased a little bit when the oral cephalic phase of digestion uh, was bypassed with nasogastric feeding. But when it was completely, the portal, whole portal circulation was uh, absorption process was uh, bypassed with intravenous feeding, the cysteine, cysteine concentrations decreased almost undetectable. And of course, increased back up uh, with uh, nasogastric feeding and, and back to normal uh, with a, a normal diet. So the, the same thing likely happens with um, other products of the transsulfuration pathway, including choline. So this is an illustration of the pathways of how, how choline uh, is uh, synthesized and also uh, metabolized. And what's important here is that we can see here that the blockage, the reason that the, there's a decrease in plasma-free choline concentration in this uh, elegant study from Tim Santago at the University of Chicago, is that there's a blockage in the glycerophosphocholine uh, metabolism to phosphocholine. And this results in a decrease in, in free choline. Now, the reason for this is, is not clear, um, but, but this is where the blockage in the pathway exists. And then what happens is the methionine concentration builds up, and methionine itself may have some toxic effects, which I'll talk about in, in, in a minute. So the hepatobiliary pathology that occur with choline deficiency, of course, as I mentioned, is uh, steatosis because uh, choline is a constituent of phosphatidylcholine that's part of the cell membranes and it's also involved in the VLDL synthesis and transport of uh, lipids out of uh, the, the, the liver. Uh, in addition, um, insufficient phosphatidylcholine in bile uh, reduces micelle uh, formation and there's an increase in free bile acid salts uh, and uh, uh, bile salts. And in addition, uh, there's a, a decrease in bioflow. And interestingly, uh, when you put hepatocytes in culture, uh, they um, develop, uh, they die, uh, apoptosis, uh, when choline is not provided uh, in the medium. So is choline deficiency the cause of eye felt? Well, probably not by itself. There probably needs to be a second hit. And in, in this study from Easton in rats, uh, one can see that um, AST concentrations are completely normal uh, when a choline sufficient uh, diet is given and saline is infused in the rats. And when a choline sufficient diet is provided to the rats, but LPS or endotoxin is administered to the rats, there's no increase in AST, which would suggest that sepsis alone is, is not a cause uh, for uh, Eifeld. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, when a choline deficient diet is provided to the animals, they develop steatosis, but they don't develop necrosis uh, uh, and severe liver disease until the LPS is added to the group that has choline deficiency, which suggests that choline deficiency sets up the steatosis, which um, sets the liver up for this uh, second hit. Um, and uh, in fact, if one gives antibody to endotoxin, that that uh, decrease uh, the the uh, steatosis uh, progressing to necrosis can be prevented. I mentioned about the methionine. Well, methionine, of course, is the precursor to, to choline. Uh, and in this study by uh, uh, Gerald Moss, uh, there's a decrease in bioflow. Uh, again, the classic Eifeld symptoms on uh, uh, signs on biopsy with balloon degeneration of the hepatocytes. Uh, inflammation around the portal triads, and also an increase in homocysteine, which we see in the parental nutrition patients in those uh, animals uh, that were um, uh, uh, that were uh, provided with uh, parental nutrition. And this actually may be a result of methionine toxicity, or it may be a result of choline deficiency. They didn't measure choline in this uh, in these uh, animals, but these are the same. Uh, signs and symptoms that would be evident in, in choline deficiency. So uh, there may be a combination effect of the increase in the substrate, which is methionine, and a toxicity that this develops. So in summary, how do we treat Eifeld? Well, the most important thing is to get patients to eat and improve absorption so they can get off of parental nutrition. Uh, and to make that most efficient, we need to maximize the amount of bowel that they have so stomas need to be taken down, repair fistulas, recruit colon uh, so there's no mucous fistula, uh, 
uh, intestinal rehabilitation, which has uh, been designed around dietary uh, and hormonal um, aspects such as GLP-2 to enhance bowel adaptation, improve absorption uh, to get these patients off of parental nutrition. We do want to diagnose and treat sepsis aggressively, even if it doesn't play a role in the development of IFELD because it itself is associated with morbidity and mortality. Although the data is very limited and retrospective, as I mentioned, uh, the standard of care today would be to reduce lipid emulsions to less than a gram per kilogram per day, uh, and also uh, dextrose to less than four to five milligrams per kilogram per minute. Whether or not uh, the, the new lipids such as uh, SMOF or the fish oil-based or olive oil-based emulsions have a role to play is not clear. For those patients that do develop end-stage liver disease, isolated intestinal transplantation is the preferred route before they get to end-stage liver disease. We really should not be seeing liver and small bowel transplants because once, a, uh, once the, the liver is essentially fibrotic and cer cirrhotic, it's unlikely that that's going to, to reverse and a liver small bowel transplant or multivisceral transplant uh, is required. How do we follow a patient with IFELD? Well, do we get serial MRs to see if they have an increase in steatosis? Not clear. Elastography, oh, that correlates more with cholestasis rather than fibrosis in this particular patient group. Serial biopsies are not a good idea either because of the morbidity and mortality associated with liver biopsies. In terms of laboratory data, well, we know that the AST and the ALT are nonspecific indicators of hepatic pathology, specific in the HPN patient as well as others. Uh, and the bilirubin is not very useful in adults uh, because it doesn't become elevated until late, later stages. And certainly if the bilirubin becomes elevated in an adult, these patients need to undergo transplant evaluation because we want to avoid a combined liver small bowel transplants. In a study that I did with the late uh, John Fryer, uh, one a biomarker of, of mortality at least uh, was CRP. Uh, and in our patients uh, with the CRP uh, of one or greater, uh, these, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, of um, the eight milligrams uh, uh, per deciliter or greater, they had a significantly greater uh, mortality than those at the end of a year uh, than those um, with lower CRPs or normal CRPs. So this may be a useful indicator uh, that a patient is progressing to need a transplant, for example. What is our problem, though? The problem is in terms of being able to differentiate those patients who have severe but still reversible liver disease from those that are irreversible and require a transplant. We need to be able to predict those who are more likely to survive a transplant, but we also don't want to transplant patients prematurely. Certainly the short-term outcomes in intestinal transplant have improved dramatically and are well over 90%, but the long-term, that is 10 and 20 year survival, uh, still in the 50 to 60% range at, at best. The bottom line is we need a better mousetrap. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bookman, and to all of our speakers for very comprehensive presentations. We are going to take a 10 minute stretch break, so please come back at 11.20 um, and we will uh, begin our panel discussion. Thank you. Welcome back. We are bringing back Drs. Martin, Kukosius, and Bookman for our panel. And also joining us now, we are happy to welcome Dr. Petrea Kober and Dr. David Mercer. Dr. Petrea Kober is a professor of pharmacy practice at Northeast Ohio Medical University College of Pharmacy and is the clinical pharmacy specialist for the NICU at Akron Children's. Dr. David Mercer is a professor of surgery in the Division of Transplantation and Director of the Intestinal Rehabilitation Program at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I'll ask each of you, Dr. Petrea Kober and Dr. Mercer, to please introduce yourselves, provide any disclosures, and for the first few minutes of our panel, share with us any comments you have about the role of phytosterols in female IFAL or any general thoughts about the talks that we just heard um, that, you know, from your perspective. So Dr. Kober, please begin. Thank you. Um, 
So I'm Patria Kober. I'm a NICU pharmacist and a professor of pharmacy practice. And um, disclosures I have, I do consult uh, for several organizations such as Baxter, Bebron, and Fresenius, and then with LexiComp, uh, the pediatric drug reference uh, for those disclosures. Really, I think the biggest thing is that from the time I started working with patients who had intestinal failure to now and just parental nutrition patients in general, I think that there's been a lot of improvement in the management that we have for these patients. And so we're seeing far less, I felt, uh, than we did before. We're better at managing our uh, nutritional resources and other things that we do for these patients. And so we've definitely seen a decrease in that population, which is great. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mercer, would you like to give some initial remarks? Yes. Hi. Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm Dave Mercer. I'm a uh, professor of surgery at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and I run our intestinal rehabilitation program. And so I have a little bit of a unique uh, role in that I care for both children and adults. So looking from, from kids from infancy all the way up to end of life at the other end of the spectrum. And so, you know, it was it was really interesting actually listening. I know that I know all of the speakers, and so it was really good to listen to the the talks this morning because it sort of I don't know, got me thinking again. And I and almost, especially listening to Alan talk, got me sort of going back over my own experience. You know, when I first um, started training as a transplant fellow twenty some years ago, um, little kids would arrive here just at six months of age or five months of age with big distended tummies looking like a, you know, a sick little bird, so jaundiced that they were green. And we would rush to try to transplant them as quickly as we could. And some would make it to transplant and some wouldn't. And it was terribly rocky afterwards. And, and so we would do, we would do great sometimes, but it was the best we could do. And, and as times have passed, you know, as things have changed, that's just gone away from us completely to the point that, you know, we're now looking after hundreds of kids with short bowel and maybe 70-ish kids on TPN at any one time. And we have almost no um, clinically evident liver disease anymore. And so there's been a lot of different things that have changed. Um, you know, when I think back to before we even had fish oil emulsions, you know, one of the first things we would do is the kids would come in being fundamentally lipid toxic, you know, three gram per kilo per day kids who are very, very cholestatic. And we would do nothing other than stop their lipids, just flat stop all lipids and pump push their glucose infusion rate up a bit. We would be undercutting them on calories because that was just the way it was. But that alone was enough to often get their cholestasis to start to reverse. And then we could reintroduce a little bit of lipid at low rates. And so we've sort of always come from a background of being relative lipid minimalists. But then when we had Omega Band, well, it allowed us suddenly to start to take that approach and use that approach in smaller and sicker kids. And we could get them to grow better. So we sort of didn't have to sit and limp along with growth, we could get them healthier and reverse their cholestasis. Once SMOF became available, I must say, we just <laughs> went off label and used it at a wholesale switch. I mean, we switched to everybody, adults and children. And, and for us, it's been very, um, very, very useful. We just don't have a lot of problems with, with clinically evident diafeld anymore. Are we doing biopsies on people to watch and see? Well, not really, but, but they're all doing pretty well. And I think that's reflected by what we're seeing in our own institutions numbers with doing transplants and in the national numbers with doing transplants. If you go back and look at my early days in the career, we, we were doing lots and lots of little kids, um, you know, between one and five years old, we're getting transplanted. And now in the United States, there's maybe one child a year or two children a year, you know, under the age of one, they're getting transplanted with intestines. So, so I think we've, we've shifted the field a little bit. When you ask me the question of how relevant is I felt it's still important because it's it's prevention sort of underlies everything that we try to do. It's just everyone this morning really made the key point was it isn't any one thing, it's all things. It's everything that you do. So it's not enough to just say, oh, if you just start a mega van and your billy ribbon goes back to normal, everything is fine. It's just that's just simply not the case. You have to do all the stuff that can be talked about and that Alan talked about and that Sam talked about. You have to be always pushing and, and then you can really do well. That's enough of my initial soapbox. Thank you. And that is uh, a really important perspective. Um, I, I also remember those babies from 20 years ago um, and I'm thrilled to hear that they aren't coming in like that anymore. 
Um, so it sounds like from all the presentations and then your your initial uh, comments, uh, Dr. Cobra and Mercer, that um, that in in the year 2022, penal IFOLD is not a big problem. Would would anyone characterize it as a big problem, or would most of you characterize it as not a big problem anymore? Go ahead, Dr. Kober. So I would still put it at the forefront because being in neonatology, we need to prevent it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's still a huge concern for mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. but we're not seeing the ramifications that we saw when I initially started uh, you know, a little less than 20 years ago, but uh, pretty similarly. Dr. Martin? Yeah, so to uh, come off that previous statement, I don't think it has to be kind of like what we talked about. It doesn't have because there are other strategies that we can utilize to prevent the penal from occurring. We talked about feeding. We talked about reduction of other comorbidities. I think sometimes I worry that the fear of penal is, is what I worry about most because of the decision making that goes into that, which I don't yeah. think what I tried to emphasize in the discussion isn't appropriate across every neonate and every risk profile. Um, so the fear of penal, I think, is alive and well, and we have to really discuss man management strategy around it. But the actual incidents, we are getting better. And I think it's the acknowledgement of the diverse pathogenesis and the different things that we can do clinically for that. Thanks so much, Dr. Bookman. Um, I, I think it's still a significant issue because it's a very significant issue for those who have IFIL and who, who and for those who uh, are potentially uh, in, in need of a, uh, of, of a uh, transplant. I think, uh, as mentioned, we've gotten substantially better in the general care of these patients, but actually I'm seeing the care get worse because we have physicians that don't even know how to fill out an order form for parental nutrition, let alone what the complications are or how, how to have a clue in managing these patients. It's less of an is issue in neonatology and pediatrics, but in adult gastroenterology, uh, there was just a study published in, in JPEN that showed that gastroenterology that around the country who thought they knew how to take care of these patients. We're not talking about ones who knew they couldn't take care of these patients. We're talking about those who called themselves experts, had no clue, and, 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 and answered only a few questions right on a, on a sample test that was given. We're seeing problems now that we haven't seen in 20 years. The care of these patients is probably the only oh, wow. disease that exists where the care has actually gotten worse over the last 30 years. Uh, we're seeing patients losing 20 pounds in the hospital because physicians are afraid to put them on parental nutrition because they're all concerned they're going to get septic and have all these problems and liver problems and, and so on and so forth. And, and these patients are becoming septic because they're malnourished. I mean, we're seeing problems now that we haven't seen. And I'm 61. So it's, it's still so a significant problem. It's still the major indication for uh, an intestinal transplant uh, is, uh, is, mm -hmm. is uh, impending liver failure. So it sounds like professional guidelines and, and training um, would be important because if, you know, some centers are able to prevent it and others are, you know, or, or you know, some are making it worse, um, then it sounds like a professional, uh, a, a, a clinical practice issue. Yes, absolutely. The training is the problem because guidelines are only useful in courts of law. Uh, when sure. there are malpractice cases, they're they're not usually used in training, and and despite congressional mandated um, uh, training in nutrition in medical schools, there's fewer medical schools now that actually train in nutrition than trained before that law was enacted. Sure. Uh, and and GI fellowship programs have don't have the people with the knowledge to be able to teach the the, the trainees, the fellows, the residents, uh, and, and students how to manage these patients. Uh, and the, because they're perhaps the most complicated patients of any disease, more mm -hmm. than any cancer, yeah. any cardiovascular disease, and, 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 and education is a big problem. And I think we're gonna start seeing more and more problems uh, in the future as, uh, as those who actually do have knowledge retire from the field, because there's very right. few individuals uh, in, in the country uh, that, uh, that know how to take care of these patients. Let's hear what Dr. Mercer has to say. Well, I'll tell you what, actually, I will defer um, to Dr. Kokoschus because he just signed on. So let's let Dr. Kokoschus go and get his bid in and then, and then perhaps I'll jump in and say something after that. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you, David, <laughs> for, for yielding the, the floor. 
you're like you're like one of one of the true statesmen of of, uh, of our country. Uh, people in the Senate wouldn't do that. Um, but anyway, the, I um, uh, I really agree uh, right down the line with Alan. I hear I uh, uh, gee, I would love to find something to disagree with here. But uh, you know, you you look at adult training programs, and you'll see twenty people doing advanced. Uh, 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 endoscopy as their their advanced fellowship to everyone who does nutrition or maybe it's 40 to one you know advanced endoscopy um, so it, it uh, so people really don't know nutrition and I, it, it really challenges my ability to to communicate diplomatically when I get referrals from around the country um, you know so-called patients who come from you know tertiary referral centers, where, where the, the PN has been mismanaged dreadfully. Uh, the other thing that I had mentioned in one of my slides is that the you know once something gets approved, uh, people tend to use it and they tend to misuse it. And I think people are misusing SMOF, they're misusing OmegaVen. Um, when somebody has a, a two times normal enzymes, instead of looking to energy overload as the cause, or um, choline deficiency, or something of that nature, or or too high a glycemic load, they look at fat. So they reduce fat to levels that produce uh, EFA deficiency. Um, you know, and I none of us really mentioned, uh, aside from Alan, mentioned uh, EFA deficiency uh, very prominently in our discussions. But but when you get down to one per kilo of um, of uh, omega men. I mean, you really, you, you're only going to have uh, arachidonic acid. You'll have no linoleic, linoleic acid. Uh, and even on one per kilo of SMOF lipid, your, your amount of linoleic acid is going to be pretty marginal. Um, so, you know, of course, in our, you know, again, we also look to, we need to look to, toward real world data. Pickler, you know, who did that, that um, study at uh, Great Ormond Street, there's another study where they actually, and it, this is an uncontrolled study, but it's real world data. They looked at lipofundin versus omegavin. And what they found was in the omegavin patients, um, and it was all comers, infants, mid, you know, older children and the like, uh, about 10% of people who were not cholestatic became cholestatic on uh, SMOF lipid. And about 25% of patients who were cholestatic when they started SMOF lipid had their cholestasis resolved. Um, you know, I think when you have patients who can eventually be rehabilitated, um, this chronic liver disease that we see in the older child is, or adults is uh, not as significant, but it remains quite significant if they cannot be rehabilitated. Those children will really need to have a, an isolated bowel transplant. So those are my opinions. Thank you, Dr. Mercer. Is it something? Is it a, a new point? Well, you know, I'll I'll just jump in and say one of the things I liked the the most about the way this panel was established in the day is that it it brought in people right from neonatology up to adults, and it's taken the broad perspective of saying what happens over the the entire life of the population of the country, and and it always has struck me, or what has been striking me even in today's discussion is. This is almost becoming like separate issues because you have like um, the, the the like our neonatal panelists, the neonatologists are kind of at the vanguard, you know, the forefront of this, where that's where maybe the discussions about therapeutic lipids and 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 all of that stuff really impacts day to day on what's going in. You know, you're talking like week by week changes and preventing things that have get magnified and have long term implications. Most of the kids that I'm seeing usually come to us when they're maybe six months old. I mean, they, they, they've sort of, by the time you get the whole transfer process going and everything else, they've got a few months under their belt. If they've been well managed, typically we just kind of have to maintain them, and, and you know, and we can usually prevent the the, the the cholestasis. So most kids now, it's it's really not an issue for us for the majority of the the uh, the children we care for. I interesting that I echo Sam's comments about the. You, there are plenty of places that call themselves expert centers. There's only like five people in the country I can actually talk to because, because you don't want to be insulting to people, but you say, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Uh, but 
But then you get further. So now we have our kids that go through teen years, they get into adulthood. I mean, everything that Alan said is so correct, which is just, if you want to be in the wild west of care, be an adult on TPN now, because there's nobody who's interested in doing it or knows what they're doing. And so everything he said is completely right. You just have, so, but, but it's not so much that you see people getting lipotoxy these things stuff. You see what he's saying, which is people who have got horrible malnutrition, you know, all of these just stuff where, you know, they're, they're just, you know, a BMI of 13 and they, and, and how does this ever happen? And so the, in an, almost, it's like an entire generation of education has been lost. So mm. his point of there's not even anyone to teach anyone anymore is starting to become true because, you know, I'm maybe on the young end of the people who are going to finish. And then I'm not sure there's many people behind me mm. who are going to pick up that torch and be able to teach people. So, so it is a, it's a challenging problem. And some of what you're talking about, but is it a problem? I, I think that almost depends on the population you're looking at it. So I think mm. some of our panelists would say, heck yeah, it's, it's right in the forefront for me. Mm -hmm. And part of my practice, eh, not that big a deal, but right. then later on it becomes a big deal again. So it's kind of an, it's an, it's an odd clinical problem. Thank you for that perspective, Dr. Kober. And I think we'll we'll probably wrap up after Dr. Kober's comments. We'll um, we'll kind of uh, take a, a right turn and, and and address a different question. Yeah, I just wanted to echo the education questions because definitely in my twenty years in nutrition support, education has done nothing but go down. If I would have to also say to contribute to the malnutrition of some of these patients, particularly home patients are the numerous drug shortages because there are so many drug shortages and there's so many drug shortage strategies. Um, the majority of the training of these physicians and prescribers is done in their residency, in their internships, and they're in hospitals who are trying to manage 45 drug shortages. And so everything is in some rationed state. So then when we do get something back, they only know the rationed protocol. So they think that that's the norm. And I'm really concerned about education moving forward. We need to go back to what we know was what was truly needed for these patients. And then just to comment um, about the newer products, I feel a lot of times um, for these newer fat emulsions, people think they can use them like we used 100% soy. And so when you don't understand the dosing of these products in relationship to the older products, then you definitely are at risk of essential fatty acid deficiency. Thank you. It sounds like um, despite folks dealing with different age groups, we're all singing about the same tune um, that education and training and um, you know practice, practice guidelines would be important. And it also sounds like the pipeline of folks interested in this um, you know, if there's a way to, to boost, boost that up, it would be fantastic. So maybe someone who's uh, listening today will, will take this on um, or, or motivate their friends. So another um, area that uh, several of you mentioned in your presentations was the relationship or perhaps the lack thereof um, between hepatic fibrosis and the various lipid emulsions. Um, we also heard that, you know, some suggestions that um, even after treatment with fish oil, the fibrosis persists. Maybe perhaps the polystasis goes away, but the fibrosis persists. Could you talk about, um, you know, any anyone um, uh, speak about the basic research and what are the, you know, the scientific underpinnings um, of of these findings that were discussed in your talks today? I don't see any hands, so I could call on someone. I think Dr. Kokosius talked a fair bit about um, the fibrosis, uh, the persistence of fibrosis. Do you have any any comments about the evidence, or Dr. Bookman? Well, I think you know. I think um, the, um, the the data that that oil has uh, anything to do with fibrosis is mixed at best. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, you know we have plenty of other well-established reasons for fibrosis. You know, I think the best model is, is, uh, is diabetic liver disease where you have both steatosis and fibrosis. And I, I see TPN management as, as being in a, uh, a surrogate 
diabetic state. I think uh, many of these patients are hyperinsulinemic and I, I think fibrosis and steatosis are really common. And I think that the older child phenotypically is almost like the adult. Um, and I, I echo Alan's sentiment that, that um, it's a, an indolent process. It takes years to progress. If they can't come off TPN, it will progress. And you know, eventually they they will become jaundiced and have cholestasis. But it's usually when they're at, at the end stage of their liver disease, um, you know, years down the road. So it, um, uh, I think um, it, and it's you know, I think that the the, the data on omega men, you know, the Boston series notwithstanding, the the bulk of the data suggests that 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 uh, fibrosis uh, persists. Um, the you know Boston, which is the, the temple of Omega Men, um, is uh, uh, has um, uh, has uh, shown that um, the AST to platelet ratio declines um, in patients whose cholestasis gets better. But um, that's a relatively it, it, it's it's a very good discriminator for severe fibrosis or for no fibrosis. But intermediate fibro for intermediate fibrosis, it's a relatively poor discriminator. So uh, I think the jury remains out on, on those data. I, I would add to, to Sam's comments that in terms of the fibrosis, I mean, we don't know that it's a reversible uh, uh, problem, but on top of that, you know, even if we, uh, it, the intestine after resection adapts, especially over the first six months, maybe even over several years. I mean, I had a patient after seven years who was 65 years old that just improved her absorption over time and got off of parental nutrition before we ever had GLP-2. Um, and so, but you have to remember that this isn't black and white. I mean, these aren't patients who have one day have an intestinal failure and the next day when you stop their parental nutrition, they don't have intestinal failure anymore. Well, technically they don't have an intestinal failure by the ICD-11. They still have severe malabsorption. So it, it just, this, this actually is proof that um, intestinal failure associated with liver disease is at least in part, if not primarily related to malabsorption because they're, they're not getting any thing toxic from the from the parental nutrition anymore but their disease still still progresses and certainly there are those who have liver disease um, that actually never even were on parental nutrition they were sort of on the borderline where they had enough intest intestine had sufficient absorption their bmi is 15 or 16 but they're able to survive uh, without getting parental nutrition so i think parental nutrition contributes in a variety of different ways but it, I, I don't even think it's probably the primary uh, issue here Thank you, Dr. Mercer. And I'll just make brief comments. Now, I, I published that that one paper that we alluded to a number of years ago, where I just took like half a dozen kids that we had biopsies on, multiple serial biopsies, um, who were also being treated with omega -Ben. My point behind that paper was to say that at the time, there, there was a few years where there was this idea that as long as your bilirubin went down, everything was okay. And you didn't really, you know, there was sort of this, I don't know, this message was starting to get propagated, maybe to say that, as long as you were on omega band, it didn't matter what else happened. You were going to be fine. Your bilirubin was going to go down. You're never going to get a central fatty acid deficiency. You know, the sun was going to rise and there'd be rainbows every day and there would never be liver disease. And even if you had liver disease, it was all going to go away. And, and I guess my point was to say that you have to keep your foot on the gas pedal because it's not enough to just see the cholestasis resolve and then say everything is fine. And so I guess I, I'm really just kind of saying again what, what the, the last two just, just said, which is... There's, you know, TPN is part of it. It really is. It's probably a big part of it, but but it, but it's not necessarily the, you know, the only thing. There are a lot of other pieces, and and that's why these, you know, the, the, the comments earlier about, um, you know, people who should be experts who think they're experts, but then they really aren't experts. Sometimes there's more damage being done by sort of the, a little bit of knowledge than there is by having no knowledge. Wow, and you know, I'm sure you know in the pediatric population at least, you know, having serial biopsies, you know, is not necessarily straightforward and, and easy. And so I think that publication and, and that um, finding is, is rather important uh, for the field. Um, I have another question, which I think we've sort of alluded to a little bit in some of these discussions. It does seem that we have, you know, developmental differences in this condition um, across different age groups. And, and of course, it's not surprising 
given you know maturation and differences in enzyme activity and function of the liver. Um, how much is understood about these developmental differences in penile to eye fault across the age groups? Um, and do we think that these differences correspond to differences in risk that can be attributable to the phytosterol component of parenteral lipids? It's clear there's a lot of other components involved other than phytosterols, but this, you know, this component, does this cause a differential risk across age groups? Go ahead, Dr. Kokoshis. Yeah, I think, um, you know, really the, the work that uh, Balistrieri, Hybe, um, Suchi did in the late 70s, 80s, and early 90s really suggests that, uh, that the immaturity of uh, these uh, transport systems tends to be limited to uh, infants, primarily premature infants, but, but also infants under a year of age. And beyond a year of age, they, they achieve pretty close to uh, their, um, the adult um, uh, transport of bile acids. I think bile acids play a big role. And we know that, that phytosterols, in, in fact, do alter uh, bile acid transport out of the liver. I mean, so, so in, in essence, there is a uh, reduction in, uh, in bile acid excretion and retention of bile acid. So, so they play a role, but there are other things that, uh, that alter bile acid transport, uh, uh, things such as endotoxin. We did a, a study years ago suggesting that um, lipoprotein binding uh, protein, which is a, a marker for endotoxemia, uh, was very high in patients with chronic liver disease. And uh, back when we were giving too much um, uh, too many nutrients and causing too, 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 uh, causing infantile cholestasis, um, we found that those with the severest liver disease had highest levels of uh, lipoprotein binding uh, protein. And then, then the other thing is, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the innate immune system, I think, is, is very important. And, and it becomes a vicious cycle when the liver starts to become fibrotic. Um, your innate immunity is reduced. TLR4 is downregulated. You don't handle bacteria as well. And the, the sicker the liver, the more likely you are to, uh, to become uh, septic. And then, and the more likely, more commonly you become septic, the sicker your liver becomes. So I think there are a number of factors that, that play a huge role here. Um, so I think that. Uh, uh, the, I think in terms of maturity, you have maturity, but you have noxious substances which alter bile acid transport. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that completely um, with the immature metabolism and the risk. But I, I must say, I'm also impressed, though, that it's not something that happens immediately with phytosterol exposure. And when I was reviewing the data and especially the curves that were presented at the beginning before any of the panelists discussions, you know, yes, the risk after 14 days, but it really substantially, maybe even at 28 days. So I think um, often that discussion was sort of the older nutritional practices and neonates was a very important consideration with the phytosterol exposure. But now that our protocols have changed and having that protocol helps, that we can limit that. And maybe the immaturity is not as much of a prominent player as it used to be if, if our practices are in line with that. And this I'm speaking again to an otherwise um, uh, neonate who doesn't have um, other surgical or GI surgical conditions that puts them in a completely different risk factor. Also kind of impressed that the um, that I also saw kind of consistent among all the talks was sort of the, the question of how effective or the role of, of SMOF in, in the pathogenesis. So again, making me think that there's some differences, but there's also some themes that Dave was mentioning that's running across all the discussions. And finally, I would just say, again, someone probably more interested in the fatty acids, again, regard, you know, than anything else, 
you know, one thing I fight often when I when I speak to neo about neonates and when I speak about this topic is that everyone has this mentality of omega sixes being bad and inflammatory, and and of course there's demonstration of that repeatedly in the adult literature, but in the neonatal literature it's actually an essential fatty acid and important along that developmental timeline. So we're balancing these two decisions about a balance that's important for neonatal development, and then again, the risk of liver injury. And there's still many people, even in neonatology, who just say, we need to avoid omega-6, it's inflammatory. And that's just developmentally an incorrect argument. Thank you so much. Any uh, additional comment, Dr. Buckman? Um, I just wanted to, to add to, to what was just said. I mean, we basically could divide the patient population into two preterm infants and everybody else up to age 120. Because everybody who's not a preterm infant basically behaves like an adult as far as this goes. And, and, and the, the immaturity of the biliary tract is, is, is really uh, not an issue. Uh, and, and the other issue here that we were faced with is chicken or egg. I mean, is elevated phytosterols in the blood simply a, a marker <laughs> that you have IFIL and have nothing to do with the pathogenesis. I mean, proof of association is not proof of cause and effect. Uh, and so I think that's something that has to be carefully considered here. Are we, are we really barking up the wrong tree with trying to reduce phytosterols? And, and in fact, even in the animal studies, and Dr. Byrne will talk this afternoon, but it's not discussed in this paper, but there's one sentence that says that, that, the, the, that the animals uh, despite having the, the very low phytosterol containing emulsion, still had uh, the description of the biopsies is identical to Eiffel. And, and the paper suggests that it was the same in all the animals. So again, the numbers improved. So, it, you know, it's like plastic surgery. You know, uh, it doesn't change your genetics if you have a facelift, but it makes you look better. Uh, and so by, by messing around with the phytosterols, uh, or is that all we're all we're doing? And I'm, I pleaded with the Boston group to do a placebo-controlled trial many years ago at an, uh, at, uh, at a, uh, a meeting of the Intestinal Rehabilitation Transplant Association, and their response that it was unethical to do a placebo-controlled trial. My response is that it's unethical not to, and we're making trying to make decisions here in the absence of a placebo-controlled trial where it's very easy to do that. But it's right. just not being done because of intellectual property rights and other and, and, and other issues. And it's just wrong. Thank you. I'm going to take a question from the uh, attendees from the audience. Um, and this is really for anyone. Um, as lipid is compounded in combinations of, with other components of nutrition products, significant changes occur in the size and stability of the lipid droplets. Could these destabilized lipid droplets contribute to the penile events? Um, is that part of the uh, part of the picture here? I don't know if those are used in any pediatric patients, the combined um, lipid with with PN. Uh, but is anyone able to speak to this question from the from the audience? Dr. Kokosius, do you still have your hand up from before? Uh, David Driscoll's on the call. I would yeah. I would ask him to comment. David, yeah, that's what I was going to say. This is a question that should be addressed to David. David, I've heard David. Speak at Aspen and discuss the fact that uh, that uh, the particle size in omega men may not be optimal, and maybe David can expound on that. Well, Dr. Driscoll is on the afternoon panel, so we may get him to weigh in on that this afternoon. Um, so we'll we'll keep that in our back pocket for for this afternoon. Um, all right. So for Dr. Kokosius. Um, we had a question about, um, I'm going to read it, <laughs> short gut in children and some bariatric procedures in adults disrupt the normal relationship between bile acids and the Parnasoid X receptor and binding the G protein coupled receptor in the distal small intestine. Consequence of this is downregulating GLP-1. Um, are you aware about um, the, the research uh, concerning this pathway and how it's modulated? Um, specifically related to in intestinal microflora changes and the development of non-alcoholic steat steatohepatitis with fibrosis. Um, has there been any research you know, to demonstrate the causality between the long-term exposure of lipid emulsions um, in, in this pathway? Uh, the, the exposure of lipid emulsions that contain a high soybean oil content 
versus those that have less? I, I think that um, I, I'm not uh, as uh, familiar with the uh, the data on lipids, but I I am familiar with data on lacking a terminal ileum, and um, you know FGF19 is a is a uh, is a, is terminal ileum derived, and uh, it it really downregulates bile acid synthesis through the uh, uh, FXR pathway. Um, so it um, I think that. Um, that uh, lacking a terminal ileum is is a huge uh, uh, plays a huge role in uh, in um, in deregulating bile acid homeostasis, um, and there are the compounds that that, that that play a role. I mean, there's no question that phytosterols downregulate um, uh, FXR and uh, you know ex vivo. Um, so I think that uh, you know there are a number of noxious substances that do that and. Uh, but uh, if you have no ileum, uh, you're in worse trouble. Uh, it is also known that both GLP-1 and GLP-2, when given to uh, both animals and humans, uh, can uh, upregulate uh, FGF4 and, and, um, and then also upregulate FXR. So, uh, so it, uh, you know, again, it's a complex subject. And, multiple factors play a role. Thank you for that. Um, does anyone on the panel want to ask a question to another panelist about anything that, um, that they've said? I would or ask a question. or um, I should just say any, any final comments. We're, we're, we're going to go a little bit beyond 12 o'clock because we began late. So um, any final comments uh, would be great at this point. Well, uh, what I'm going to ask a question of Dr. Martin, which is just because she's really at the forefront of what I consider sort of the sexy part of managing lipids. Is so what, like, what, what, what do you think? Like, what is next? Um, how do we, how do we individualize lipids, or is that the direction you think things are going to go? I, I'd like to hear what you think. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I really do, you know, as as I think Alan mentioned, preterms and then everybody else. And, and so um, when I'm asked to speak of this and consider this topic, as I mentioned before, always trying to think about what they should be seeing if they had otherwise remained in utero for the protection of all the other organs besides the liver, the brain, the lung, the eye. Um, so right now, all the choices we have just profoundly disturb the postnatal fatty acid balance, and, and we do need greater innovation to protect the infant and give them what they need to support development. And so I think we just need to um, really fine tune these populations. And as I mentioned, I think for the low birth weight infant, we need to preserve what we can, even though we don't have great options. So already we're behind the game. But I, I prioritize development over the liver because I know we can feed the small ones. If you don't have a surgical condition, we can feed them and that's what we should do. If you have a surgical condition, that's where it does become a bit more controversial because you know you're gonna be on it for a longer period of time. And this is where I started to think, actually when I was listening to everybody, maybe it goes back to the pediatric surgeon, You know, are there things we can do like earlier corrective surgery or even protocols around post surgical care that we can keep in mind the duration of treatment and balancing the two. Um, but absolutely, why, and that's kind of was my final comment about a call also to the pediatric surgeons and that and that high risk, the non-preterm, but the newborn with a surgical condition. Um, but we need more innovation. And, and that's why I love these kind of workshops because we got to keep pushing the limits. We can't be satisfied with our current choices. That's terrific. Any comment, uh, Dr. Dr. Kokoshis? I'm not sure if your hand is still up um, or if it is up again. No, oh, it's well. It, I didn't put it up again, but I uh, I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Martin. I think she's thank you. Great. I think most of us do. It's hard to disagree with her, um, Dr. Bookman. Um, my final comment is this: is that when parental nutrition was first uh, started. Um, well, in the night, the lipids first uh, came out in the 1940s with uh, the cottonseed based emulsion that, that killed a few people and so on and so forth. But essentially, with the AMA expert panel that convened, I think around uh, 1972 or something for the first time, I mean, the, the idea was to try to replicate 
the diet uh, and what do we need for the diet and what's the percentage of absorption? Uh, so how much of what do we need to put in the parental nutrition? And I can tell you when, when I eat a good prime steak that's marbled with fat, it's not marbled with intralipid. It's not marbled with SMOF. It's not marbled with quinolake. These are artificial fats that have no relationship to the diet. You don't eat this stuff. In fact, it, I, I, it would probably be disgusting to do so. I mean, we can water the plants uh, with, with TPN and they grow like, they grow amazing. Uh, I've never tried to water my plants with, with the fat emulsion. I don't think the results would be the same. And so although the vitamin C that's in parental nutrition is the same vitamin C that's in fruits and in your diet, the lipids that we're administering are not the same mm -hmm. as what are in your diets, not at all. And they're artificial products. So we clearly need to have better designed lipid really is the fat that's in the diet. So we'll need some other um, acronym other than SMOF. I'm not sure what it's gonna have in it, but we'll, we'll see. And then of course we have Dr. Martin's um, suggestion of a, of a designer lipid for, for uh, preterm neonates, which you know I, I think sounds like a terrific idea. Um, any other final comments from Dr. Kober or anyone else on the panel? If not, I wanna thank everyone for a terrific, terrific talks and a wonderful discussion. Um, it's been such a pleasure to uh, host you all for this meeting. Um, we are going to take a 30 minute lunch break. Um, and so please come back at 1235 um, for the afternoon sessions. Thank you.